Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In the ever-changing landscape of global economics, it is imperative to understand the intricacies of central bank policies, debt management, and the underlying dynamics that shape our financial systems. Lynette Tseng, a seasoned financial analyst with decades of experience, provides valuable insights into these complex matters. In this comprehensive video, we'll delve into her expert analysis of recent events, including the Bank of Japan's actions, treasury debt issuance, interest rate fluctuations, and the impact on currency values. As we explore Zhang's observations, we'll uncover the driving forces behind the decisions made by central banks and how they influence our financial future. Zhang begins by highlighting recent developments at the Bank of Japan, where a pattern of contradictory strategies has emerged. She compares these strategies to a widening interest rate band, suggesting that such actions may be driven by a loss of control rather than an orchestrated plan. This prompts the question of whether central banks are attempting to maintain an appearance of control while grappling with underlying uncertainties. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. You know, following on the heels of what happened over at the Bank of Japan, and also uh, you might have noticed that the Treasury is issuing a preliminary discussion on buying back some debt. So after the downgrade, they came out and said they're going to do $103 billion, which was in new debt, which was more than anybody had anticipated. And then they turn around and say that we're going to we're looking at doing a bond buying program. It's kind of what happened at the Bank of Japan, right? When they were loosening their band, their interest rate band, and I personally think it's because they're losing control. And so better to make it look like we're remaining in control and widening that band. But then shockingly, interest rates went up. So then they announced the buyback, right? So they're they're loosening here and they're tightening here. And it, it, it's like they're schizophrenic. And we just did the same darn thing. We get downgraded, which means that interest rates go up and all the interest rates spiked from, you know, two years to 30 years and everything in between. And now we announced that we're maybe buying back, you know, we we're setting up a program to buy back our debt. So if they buy back the debt, that would be lower interest rate debt to roll it into higher interest rate debt. I mean, doesn't that seem like a little bit of a schizophrenic problem to you? <laughs> I mean, I've studied currencies and currency life cycles since 1987. And I 100%, a bazillion percent know that the current iteration of this fiat money experiment, it actually died in 2008. So it's going away. And if you even look at the loss of purchasing power just since 2008, forget the fact that since the Fed's been in charge, it's 97% loss of purchasing power. Just since 2008, that has escalated just in the last year from all of this quantitative easing, which we're told is not going to create inflation and blah, 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 blah. I mean, lie, 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 let's lie some more. Because every single time they do that, the value of what's already out there goes down. It's easy to create that. But I do see a silver lining. So I do not see any way that, uh, that, that there's going to be a turnaround in the current circumstance because we are way too far gone. I mean, it's based on a constantly compounding the debt. The discussion shifts to the U.S. Treasury's issuance of debt following a downgrade and a subsequent buyback program announcement. Zhang raises a thought-provoking point regarding the seeming contradiction of buying back lower interest rate debt to roll it into higher interest rate debt. This move challenges conventional wisdom and prompts reflection on the true intentions of these actions. Drawing on her extensive knowledge, Zhang delves into the history of fiat currencies and their life cycles. She asserts that the current iteration of the fiat money experiment effectively died in 2008, with a focus on the loss of purchasing power since then, she contends that this erosion has escalated due to quantitative easing measures, dispelling claims that these measures do not contribute to inflation. Zhang emphasizes the pervasive nature of devaluation and highlights the need to recognize the underlying trend of diminishing purchasing power. 
A noteworthy perspective Zhang offers is the significance of rising gold prices as a harbinger of currency failure. Central banks in Wall Street often suppress the true value of gold, but Zhang argues that astute investors, including the ultra-wealthy, recognize its intrinsic worth. This recognition stems from their understanding of the ongoing wealth transfer mechanism and the potential to shift purchasing power. By juxtaposing the behavior of central banks with that of informed investors, Zhang underscores the contrast between public perception and economic reality. And so when you see what's happening over, well, really, even Germany is the last AAA-rated sovereign out there, and they're in, in deep recession, right? So when you look at the central banks who admitted that they do not understand inflation, they certainly never admit that they created this problem. Their job is to regulate the rate and speed of it so that the public doesn't ask for more money. And I understand your question because one of the things that they knew when they created the system is that people marry the legal money of the state and they cannot help but think that it will regain some of its lost value. But here's a reality. It never does, period. It never does. You can look on the purchasing power chart and back when in at 20, between 29 and 33, it looks like the purchasing power went up. Just like in 2008, it looks like the purchasing power went up. Well, you probably weren't around in, in uh, 1933, but during the depression, do you ever recall anybody saying how great their purchasing power was during the depression? That would be a no. And you probably remember 2008. So, you know, do you notice that did it get so great during 2008? So really that part is a, an absolute lie. However, the bright spot and the opportunity is that since a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency, it is the central bank's job to, and, and Wall Street's job, to suppress the visible price that you see. Because for some crazy reason, people actually believe the garbage that Wall Street puts out. I, I don't know why. You know, maybe because I worked there for so long and I know that it's garbage. But the opportunity, if you look at what the central bankers are doing for themselves, and when you look at what the ultra wealthy are doing for themselves, they're buying gold. And the reason why they're buying gold is because they 100% know how severely undervalued it is. And that whoever holds their purchasing power, since this is a complete wealth transfer mechanism, Whoever holds their purchasing power has the opportunity to have the wealth shift their way because wealth never disappears, just changes location. You sell a stock at, at 100 and it goes to 500 in nominal terms, that was your wealth transferring. They sell you a stock at 100 and it goes to zero, hmm, that's your wealth being transferred. So we have to recognize the true trend which is the purchasing power trend. You, you can see that quite clearly. It's not coming back. It never has over 4,800 times. It's not happening now either. Zhang addresses the issue of trust in central banks and governments. Highlighting the historical redeemability of currencies, she contemplates the necessity of accountability in a system that allows redemption. She asserts that gold and silver, due to their tangible nature and gendered trust that is lacking in purely fiat currencies, Zhang invokes the famous quote by J.P. Morgan that gold is money, everything else is credit, reinforcing the enduring value of precious metals. Zhang dissects the bailout and stimulus actions undertaken during economic crisis. She points out the selective nature of these interventions, favoring corporations and elites over the general public. By comparing responses to the 2008 financial crisis with those of 2020, she exposes the widening gap between the interests of different sectors of society. Zhang argues that the true beneficiaries of these interventions are often corporations rather than the public. I think that redeemability is everything because that's what always held a government, a central bank accountable because there are limits. If you can redeem it, then they have to hold at least a certain level there. Even in the fractional reserve system, there is a certain level of physical that they would have to hold. 
But if they don't, I mean, do you trust them? It's yeah, a, it, I mean, it could potentially be another con game. I think the only people I trust less than my government would probably be the Chinese government or the Russian government, right? I mean, or any <laughs> government. Yeah, totally. In gold, in silver, we trust because you hold it and you own it. Yeah. And wasn't it JP Morgan's own quote, right? Gold is money, everything else is credit. Yep. And that's a fact. And everything else is a contract. And they're changing the contracts right now to accommodate the Fed now. And they have them buried in such a deep place that unless you're a little ferret like I am and you dig and dig and dig and dig and dig, you have no idea that anything has changed when in reality, everything has changed. That noose is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, I think it goes back to what Janet Yellen said about, you know, they bailed them out of, don't call it a bailout. It was totally a bailout, but don't call it a bailout. <laughs> um, you know, but who got bailed out? It was Silicon Valley. It was the hedge funds. So it's still selective. And of course, when they talked about that, they talked about that being selective. So if it was a bank that was primarily for the public and not the elites, that's when it would be way too expensive to bail out. They didn't want you to know. And if they did a bail in, you would have known about it. Yeah. See, they can and for do those it in Cyprus because that's so far away. People go, well, that's over there. But they're just not ready for us to realize that our wealth is being absolutely captured. They will do this until it becomes too expensive. And when it becomes too expensive, it's because the primary entities are individuals, are the public. And even look at what happened, you know, from 2020 and all of that stimulus, they could not do what they did in 2008 by just bailing out the banks. So they gave some, lots of money and did all sorts of stimulus to the public. But if you look at the level of stimulus and who really made out well, it wasn't the public. It was again, the corporations that have been charging a ridiculous, they call it greedflation. But of course, that's not contributing to the inflation. It's not those lofty payouts to the CEOs, you know, at 3,000 times the average worker. That has nothing to do with it. It's the average worker asking for more money because the inflation has become obvious. And what's the Fed's job? Price stability. Now, if you don't know their language, you go, well, yeah, we want that glass to just remain the same price. That's not price stability. It is holding inflation at that 2% target rate because that is, they're still getting what they want, but it's happening so slow that you do not change your purchasing decisions or your wage decisions. That's price stability for the central banks. They just call it that because then if you hear it, you think, oh, well, yeah, they're trying to keep the prices stable.